one thing that is uh, very commonly used when we're speaking about domestic violence is uh, the power and control wheel. And this is a way that shows how the different types of abuse are connected and how they work together to make it very difficult for someone who's experienced abuse to leave that situation. And many times people are not aware of all these different types of abuse. Um, because typically if you ask somebody, what do you think of when you hear the word domestic violence? Or what do you think is abuse? People will often mention something physical like bruises or broken arm or something like that, yeah, uh, strangulation, mm -hmm. something that is visible. Um, and sometimes it's not recognized that all these other forms are also abuse. Um, so things like um, emotional and verbal abuse, such as put downs, making the other person feel bad about themselves, calling them names, uh, gaslighting, trying to make, which is a form of abuse that's trying to make the person think they're crazy um, or doubt their sense of reality. Like, no, I didn't say that. Or, you know, you never remember things right. Or, I didn't mean it that way. You're too sensitive. Things like that. Um, playing mind games, humiliation making them feel guilty for things that they didn't do. And then we have isolation, which is controlling what she does, who she sees, where she goes, mm -hmm. um, gradually cutting her off from those other sources of support, such as friends and family members, trying to put a wedge between the person and their family. Um, this may take the form of saying, you know, I don't like you hanging around your family because they don't like me. Um, they try to tell you I'm a bad person. Um, you know, um, you should want to spend all your time with me. You don't need to have any friends. You don't need to go anywhere and do anything. Mm -hmm. And so gradually, um, the abuser can make it so difficult and miserable for the person when they do have contact with friends or family that they just end up self-isolating and sort of choosing to back off um, and then the friends and family don't understand why right. and they become angry and this can cause a lot of tension in those relationships mm -hmm. I have a um, question Cindy when you were um, working with victims and survivors and kind of providing the psychoeducation were there what was your experience like with just providing this information because sometimes I know on for me as a professional like these things that you just mentioned and listed like are not commonly known as abuse right right yeah um, and a lot of people would say like wow I, I hadn't thought of that or you know maybe they hadn't really realized that that was what was happening until it's until it's mentioned um, and of course you know some people don't experience every type of abuse and they might not have experienced a certain type of abuse but they've experienced others and now, sometimes people are just not really ready to identify their experience as abuse. But if I can share the information with them, um, if I can give them a copy of this power and control wheel to look at or tell them, you know, to look it up. I mean, it's Googleable. It's free. You can just Google power and control wheel and it will come up. And so it, it plants those seeds. Right. Yes. Exactly. That's what I was thinking. It's like it's planting that seed of even if they're not like ready to be like, oh, okay, so I'm experiencing, you know, some kind of abuse or whatever it may be, them reading this or even just having like this information shared 
can start those reflections of being like, oh, next time this happens and I'm getting gas, you know, gaslighted, it's like, I recognize that under that emotional abuse high slice on that power and control will so it's it can be so impactful to just plant that seed even if individuals aren't ready to fully see what's going on exactly exactly another category is minimizing denying and blaming and this is where the abusive partner makes light of the abuse or says um i didn't really mean it or I didn't really hurt you, or it's not that bad, um, or sometimes even things like you just bruise easily, or um, you know, I didn't, I didn't throw you down. I barely touched you, and you tripped and fell. Um, things like that. Sometimes it takes the place of just saying flat out, "It didn't happen. I didn't do that." And sometimes it's shifting responsibility for the abusive behavior. This one seems to be one that we really see the most is shifting that responsibility onto the victim or survivor. If you hadn't done X, I wouldn't have, quote, had to do Y. Um, Right, yeah. I did it because you made me. You made me mad, and you know what happens when you make me mad. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. You should have known better than to go there or do that or talk to that person. Right. Yeah. That one I hear, I've heard pretty frequently in my clinical work and my arms are like (laughs) all tingly right now. Mm -hmm. Just like that one's really powerful. It is. Yeah. And I think that's important to note also, you know, the impact on yourself as a professional, you know. Mm -hmm that sometimes we can have, um, you know, reactions occur Mm -hmm. within our bodies to, Mm -hmm. to hearing about abuse or to sharing about abuse. Right. There's also use of children. And this is when the abuser tries to, um, make the, the partner in some way feel guilty about the children, using the children to relay messages, using the children that are old enough as spies, you know, hey, has mom been having any any new men come around? Um, Who's mom talking to? Um, Things like that. Um, Using visitation and custody arrangements against the survivor, um, causing trouble. worked with many, many people who've been very afraid every time they had to go make a drop off or a pickup of their child at a visitation because um, they know that there's going to be verbal abuse and sometimes threats that happen at those times. Um, Threatening often to take the children away, to disappear with the children, to say you'll never see the children again. Um, say, you know, there's no way you would win custody in court. No judge would ever let you have the children. Um, I've got the money for the lawyer. And so I would be sure to win in court. All of those kind of things are used to harass and intimidate the victim or survivor into compliance. Yeah. I'm curious for you, Cindy, in in my experience, both like professionally and personally, I feel like the using children is somewhat more like justified to like the perpetrators, like families and friends. It seems like when, you know, they're using children to like make you feel guilty or they're checking up on you using the children right like your friends and family are like oh well they're just like a really like caring parent right like they they just want to make sure like the mom or whoever isn't doing you know x y and z so i'm curious for you like have you seen that like this is something that's maybe a little bit more i guess like i don't know what i don't know like what the word is but that like people are more encouraging of using or prone children. to like using kids right like and that yeah, being like more violence. okay like to some people 
Sure, I know. It, I think I understand what you're saying there. Um, a lot of times that can be part of the abuser's manipulation. They also manipulate their own friends and family um, into supporting their side of things. Mm -hmm. you know? And so absolutely they can portray it as they can say all kinds of things about the child's mother uh, who that are not true or that are just twisted and portrayed in a very unflattering light mm -hmm. um and so they they definitely can cause their friends or family to feel concerned for the well-being of the children um, and that can be part of the abuse yeah um, definitely yeah i have another question for you cindy what is it like or what was your experience like when you worked with um offenders and they were learning that they were engaging in these different types of domestic abuse what was that like well it was really interesting and sometimes very challenging um the program that i was in um it was a 27 week like a class type of program for offenders and that's pretty standard some some states have programs that are shorter um but it seems like 24 or 27 is pretty, pretty common. And um, usually they would come in very resistant at first because almost none of them were attending the classes voluntarily. They were attending because it was a, they had been charged with domestic violence and placed on probation. And one of the conditions of probation was to complete this class. So if they didn't complete it, they could end up in jail or um, the victim survivor had achieved a, a protective order against them and one of the conditions of the protective order might be for them to attend the class or they would be in violation of the protective order. So um, they were already, you know, angry and not really in the headspace to receive the information a lot of times. Um, but what we typically saw was that over a course of up to about eight or 10 weeks, they would start to kind of make a turnaround sometimes. Um, and sometimes we would start to see kind of like the aha moments, like they would become start to become accountable and to recognize you know that yes I did do these things and I can see how that impacted my partner and I can see how that led to the consequences um, and really why we were working with the offenders um, was to increase safety of victims and survivors because we want the abuse to stop and we know that you know very often um, Victim survivors will end up continuing to be in contact with the people who've abused them, um, whether that's because they have, you know, another 15 years of child custody and visitations and things to get through, or whether it's because they do reunite at some point in time, which does sometimes happen. Um, there are going to be times where that contact is going to happen and we want that survivor to be safe we also want if this offender goes on to have future relationships we want those partners to be safe and so we want for the offender to be able to become accountable for the actions that they have done and to take steps to make the changes they need to I know we'll probably touch on this when we start talking about statistics, but I'm curious if um, offenders themselves are ever victims and survivors of, you know, this power and control of domestic abuse. Yeah, that's a really good, really good question. Um, we saw that a lot, in particular when we had... Um, uh, female offenders who were referred, which was a very small percentage, but when we did have them, they typically um, had been 
victims and survivors sometimes even in the current relationship but something happened where when the incident happened that brought them to be in the program they had been the one uh, to be charged at that time for some reason but very often it there had been a very long history of their own victimization leading up to it um, and in fact they were often defending themselves at the time but if the police show up and one partner has a scratch on them or a bruise or something mm -hmm. um, and the other partner maybe doesn't because you know the way he had been touching her didn't happen to leave any marks that were visible yet but she had maybe clawed his face because she was trying to get his hands away from around her throat right. but when the police show up maybe those marks on the throat aren't showing up yet but that scratch on the side of his face is bleeding mm. that sometimes leads to her being arrested as the offender in that case so that's one scenario. Another scenario is that even with the male offenders, we did experience a lot of them who had witnessed domestic violence as children. Oh, they had wow. seen their fathers or their mother's boyfriends abuse their mothers. Not in every case, but it was very common. Right. Um, and we had also seen some cases where they themselves were abused. It's very common for someone who is an abuser as an adult to have been abused as a child. Right. So like repeating these learned behaviors. Right. Like toxic right. thing or yep. Exactly. Exactly. Um, economic abuse or financial abuse is another form of abuse that's on the wheel that people a lot of times do not recognize or they haven't thought of it as abuse. But this can very often happen as preventing the survivor from obtaining or maintaining employment. Many survivors have been unable to get a job or unable to keep a job because of interference by the abuser. One common strategy is to convince her, like maybe when they first move in together or they get married, that well, we don't need two cars. You don't need to have a car anymore. You know, I'll just take you where you need to go or, you know, you're going to be staying home anyway. So I'll just take the car to work. We don't need to pay for two cars. And, and so they cut off a big source of independence for that survivor by intentionally doing that. Um, if she does have a job, a lot of times they'll interfere to the point that she loses that job, either by like constantly calling or showing up, causing trouble. Um, sometimes the employer becomes worried for the safety of everybody on in the environment. And they're like, you know, we can't have you here because he's too dangerous for everybody else to be exposed to. Um, or sometimes just she's having too many absences because he won't let her go to work or he's beaten her so badly that due to bruises all over her face she can't you know she doesn't feel like she can go in public that way um so there are so many ways um also if she does work kind of fun diverting her pay you know forcing her to put have her paycheck deposited into an account that only has his name on it or um something like that since most people do direct deposit these days um that's a common way of doing it or and saying that he'll give her an allowance you know i'll give you enough to get the groceries and you know this and that um i i had worked with many clients who had some sort of maybe they had gotten a settlement from a car wreck or maybe they'd had a grandmother die who had left them money or something and the abuser ran through that money totally manipulated the survivor and got access to that money and left her with nothing um so sometimes the abuser may lie about how much money they're making. They may divert some of their own income into an account 
that the survivor doesn't know anything about. Um, you know, they may uh, criticize her for every little penny she wants to spend, uh, for every little thing she needs. Um, so there's a lot of ways that financial abuse can happen. Right. I've heard before of, um, like, the husband saying, oh, well, you're really bad with money, so I'm going to manage it. But it's all about portraying it as being, like, the martyr almost, right? Like, well, if you have control of the money, then who knows what you'll spend it on, right? And then, of course, like, the victim survivor's like, oh, okay, well, I guess, right? Because now I'm made to feel like I'm a problem here, so they need to have control. And it's like, that's a really easy way that you probably don't even think about it, because you're like, oh, they're trying to help me, right? right? They're trying to prevent me from, like, not having money, but in fact, right, it's just like a really uh, easy way of taking control, so that you don't have access to finances. Right, exactly. And you make such a good point. Uh, many of these forms of abuse can initially be portrayed by the abuser as something loving or caring. Right. Because I'm just concerned for you. I want you to be safe. So I don't want you going out yeah. uh, at night with your friends because it's not safe to do. Or, I, you know, you don't need to drive. I can drive you you know, or mm -hmm. like you mentioned, um, you're not good with money. Let me pay the bills because I have a lot more experience with that. Right. Exactly. Okay. And, and then when they're thinking about like, oh, well, all of this stuff has been done with love and they care for me. Right. Mm -hmm. It's hard when you're actually looking at it as like, oh, this is power and control. This is, this is not the loving nature that, you know, was tried to be portrayed to me but in fact this was me slowly losing power and control of my life in multiple ways and I didn't even notice it because they're such good like con artists basically about this exactly exactly and it's very hard of course for somebody to come to that realization right because you know if you love somebody you want to think the best of them you want exactly. to believe that they have your own best interest at heart and it's very hard to come around to believing that this person is intentionally doing things that are harmful right. Yeah, I always uh, compare it to when you have like a breakup and it's like that tendency when you're looking back like, oh, all the good things that this person did and it's like, okay, but like there was actually like a lot of bad, but it's just, it's easier and it's better. It makes us feel good to think about the good, right? And that can exactly. overshadow the bad really easily. Right, yeah. exactly. As you exactly. both were sharing, I just kind of realized as you were sharing like, these different forms of violence and abuse are like there's seeds in them and like our cultural backgrounds certain gender roles in those cultural backgrounds or even in religious um, beliefs and practices like there are just seeds everywhere and it yeah. can be hard to identify when you're born into it or you think they're helping or beneficial for you spiritually right or this is your duty as a woman to do this exactly yeah. such a good point that you make there because there are so many times when I've worked with clients who have you know explored different features of their cultures that they've come from and how that has impacted the norms and values within those cultures that sometimes um, support patriarchy and support um, right. abuse. Some in, in some countries, I've worked with people who have come to the United States, and in the country they came from, domestic violence was not a crime, yeah. and it was completely normalized and expected. Um, and so, yeah, it's very very difficult. Um, and then uh, sometimes they meet a partner over here who's from that same country or they come over here with someone from that country and then they start to be exposed to you know the ways that it is a crime and it's not right mm -hmm. and then their partner continues to try to keep them from that information and yeah. 
you know, maintain that power and control. The next one we were going to talk about, in fact, is male privilege, which is often used. Um, and of course, if you're talking about a same sex relationship, um, then even so, one, pa- one partner is trying to have a level of privilege and a level of power over the other person. Um, so it may be one person treating the other one like a servant or saying that they get to make all the big decisions mm-hmm. um, or acting like kind of the uh, king of the castle idea. Right. That, um, I'm the one who has the ultimate authority and you have to submit to my authority. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking of like, um, even like from a personal standpoint, like religious, like growing up, I was like, my religion was very much the man was over the woman. Like man was top of the umbrella, then women, then children. And what we saw a lot was unless like your husband cheats on you, right? You're supposed to stay with them. So it didn't matter the emotional abuse, the physical abuse, anything like that, because that was your husband and you were supposed to be subservient to them. And that breeds a lot of this like violence and intimate partner violence that goes on. And some people are just like, well, that's just what I'm supposed to take on and deal with as, you know, a, a doting wife. And it's just, it's like, well, actually, it's not right. Not okay. Right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And a lot of times there's like a misinterpretation of scriptures from different religions, um, very much a, pick, a cherry picking, you know, a taking out of context of a sentence here and there right. um, to portray that male privilege perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I agree a hundred percent. But that's definitely used and especially for survivors who have had their church be such a big part of their lives and that's been a large part of their social support network. Um, to start to dismantle this in their mind and then to start to reject that those teachings and to try to separate themselves it's like it's not just losing the partner it's losing so much more of their lives uh it's right. losing their worldview their mm-hmm. beliefs their values their wider support system mm-hmm. um, so it's really understandable that it's very difficult to, to make that change. Right. Um, and then there's coercion and threats, which is making or carrying out threats to do something to hurt the person or um, sometimes making threats for the abuser to kill themselves, um, which that's always tricky because on the one hand, like you always want to take threats of suicide seriously and never want to minimize that um, in case the person is um, actually having those thoughts. There are times when that's also used as a an abuse tactic by an abuser, um, particularly if they believe that the survivor is thinking of leaving. Um, if you ever leave me, I'll kill myself, you know. Um, and it'll be your fault, um, that kind of thing. And I have worked with survivors who have felt like they couldn't leave because they were afraid that the abuser would kill himself if they did leave. And they felt that that was a burden of guilt that they would not be able to bear. You know, even though, of course, we talked about the fact that it would not be their fault that or their responsibility. Um, but it's hard it's hard to really feel that deep inside um and they may also threaten to report her to child welfare i've had many many clients who've had frivolous reports made to child welfare repeatedly by an abuser or an abuser's family members um, and you know, it's just, it's just hassling her by way of the child welfare system and wasting the resources of the very overstretched child welfare system. Um, also, um, 
you know, making her drop charges, making threats to her if she doesn't drop charges or if she doesn't drop bail him out of jail, um, making her do illegal things such as use drugs or sell drugs or steal, you know, survivors are sometimes made to steal um, to obtain items. And that's all a part of the power and control because then he has something he can hold over her. He has something that he can make her believe you know, because you did these things, I can call the police and get you arrested and get the children taken away from you. So it's all a part of that power and control. But yeah, the green flags are things that are also available on what we call the equality wheel. So it's the counterpoint to the power and control wheel that we talked about earlier. And, um, Basically, it um, talks about things like um, negotiation and fairness. We want to seek mutually satisfying resolutions to conflict. We want to accept change, be willing to compromise. Um, Non-threatening behaviors such as being willing to talk and act so that your partner feels safe and comfortable expressing themselves, not trying to be domineering or intimidating or threatening in your body posture or your tone of voice or anything. Um, respect, respecting the other person, just listening to them non-judgmentally, being emotionally affirming and understanding. Um, and valuing their opinions, letting them know that what you think, what you feel matters to me. Trusting and supporting the person, supporting her goals in life. That goes back to that being your biggest cheerleader. Yes. Um, respecting that she has the right to her own feelings, friends, activities, and opinions. That, you know, the best relationships are those where each person has their own life and they have their own friends and their own activities and their own interests and they're together not because they have to be but because they want to be and they mesh well together because being with you adds value to my life um, honesty and accountability accepting responsibility for oneself acknowledging if there was a past of violence or acknowledging any mistakes that are currently made admitting when you're wrong communicating openly and truthfully um, responsible parenting which means sharing parental responsibilities not using the children in the ways that we talked about from the other wheel uh, but being a positive nonviolent role model for children not asking them to spy on mom and tell you who mom's hanging out with um, you know and not using court custody situations as threats against the mom. Shared responsibility involves mutually agreeing on a fair distribution of work without really thinking about, okay, this is men's and this is women's or whatever the case may be within the relationship, even if it's a same sex relationship, just mutually agreeing on a fair distribution of work and making family decisions together um, allowing each person to have their input. Economic partnership means making money decisions together. Even if only one partner is earning an income and bringing money into the family, recognizing that that money is for the entire family and that, you know, both adults should have the capacity to access the funds and to make decisions. just take a look at the two wheels side by side and see where your relationship falls. Um, usually one wheel or the other will look more like your relationship overall. Sometimes there may be some overlap. Not all relationships are a hundred percent one or the other, right. uh, but see where your relationship lands overall on these wheels.